Well, good morning. You're a good class, I can tell <laughs> already. Um, I'm Carmen Colangelo. I'm the dean of the Sam Fox School. Um, I'm so happy that you're here. Uh, it's fantastic. I love when the parents come to town and uh, love that you're bringing your students to us at Washington University in St. Louis and specifically to the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts. Um, first of all, congratulations to all of you. You've done an amazing job. If your student, your son or daughter are here, they've done well and you've done a great job raising them. I think you already know how competitive it is. I looked it up this morning this year. Um, we only admitted 11% uh, of applications, uh, applicants. So congratulations to you. Here we go. Hey, let's go. <laughs> it's huge. I know how, I know how it feels, uh, especially if you're a first time uh, parent with a college kid. Any of you have a first time uh, college? Yeah, right. Thanks. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, you're starting to feel it. <laughs> I'm about number two. All right, experience, experience. You don't look as sweaty. Uh, number and three and three. Okay, wow, wow. I have three kids that all went to college, and I feel pretty good. Uh, they're done, <laughs> and they have jobs. Uh, and um, I'm about four. Darn, yeah, all right. You win the award. I'm. I, I have to. You have to see me after. And five. Wait, I think you won the award. Five. Okay, okay. Well, here, here's congratulations to all of you, all of you. And um, I noticed that you look younger every year, so that's another, <laughs> another thing. I've been here as the dean of the Sam Fox School uh, now f uh, for s 17 years. I'm starting my, officially starting my 17th year, so here, let's hear it for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I like to say that I'm the longest standing dean, but not the oldest. And that's true, but just marginally these days, so I'm getting closer to that. But, this is an amazing place to be. You've picked an amazing school. You're going to learn uh, why, or it's going to feel more so every day. Uh, maybe not every single day when you hear from your, uh, your student, but, but overall, uh, that's our experience. We are here to serve you and the students and to uh, bring to them the best education in art and design. Uh, and architecture that we can, as well as in a liberal arts research environment. So that is a lot. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty short, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. But I want you to know that as we do this, we want your questions at the end. We're going to leave time for that. Um, and, uh, and then the test, it'll take about 15 minutes. So, <laughs> so you'll have all of those things. Uh, uh, you'll have time for all of that. Um, so I'm just going to tell you first a little bit about the school, so you, context. Uh, we are unique in our structure, uh, as some of you know. We have, uh, I'm the dean of the Sam Fox School, which is the College of Architecture uh, and the Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Design. And it's also the College of Art and the Graduate School of Art. And then also the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum next door. These are the profile uh, in the foreground, the Mildred Lane Kemper, Kemper Art Museum next door here. Uh, Steinberg actually situates itself right back here where we are over here, behind here. And then the new Weill Hall, which is principally designed for graduate uh, art and design and architecture studios and landscape architecture. But it's also uh, houses our digital fabrication, common space, uh, and also uh, a nice, if you haven't been upstairs, and you'll see the beautiful green wall up there. This is quite an accomplishment because this wasn't tr there when I came. Uh, it was the envi envision this idea that all our graduate students who were off campus and our undergraduates be on the same campus, six buildings next to the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, which is a world-class museum. In fact, um, one thing I also want you to know, even though I'm the inaugural dean of the school and started in 2006, we're old. We've been around a long time. The art school, Fine Arts, was uh, founded in 1879. It founded the museum in 1881. So we're the oldest art museum west of the Mississippi. We precede the St. Louis Art Museum, and we have a phenomenal collection. And quite a legacy, too. Uh, this is a picture, uh, uh, the, the, the work that you see here, Max Beckman taught here in the 1947 to 49. And Philip Gustin also taught here before that. So those of you who know your art world figures know that those are important figures. Uh, Max Ernst is over here. Leger is over here. 
and so on. So we have an amazing collection, and that's just next door for the students to study, and it's an important part of the school. And I'm speaking about it because our director of the museum is in here today, and you're going to hear more deeply about the College of Art and Architecture from Amy and Constance shortly. We also do phenomenal exhibitions that are special exhibitions that are curated. This is a photograph from Ai Weiwei exhibition called Bear Life. Uh, and so the next exhibition coming up, special exhibition, or installed, is being installed right now, is Adam Pendleton. Some of you might know his work. He recently had a show at the Museum of Modern Art. So they really have exposure not only to the art and architecture disciplines that come here to study, everything in between. We encourage the interdisciplinary and um, you know, they'll have an opportunity to experience the, the shows up close and personal and sometimes even work with the artists if they want to work in the museum side of things. We also, uh, I'm sure you know maybe, or you'll be asking about which semester they should go. <laughs> we, we have focused our study abroad in Florence. Uh, that came about uh, even 15 years ago. We decided this would be our primary focus for maybe some obvious reasons. Uh, you know, it's a great city for obviously the Renaissance art and architecture, but it's a modern city too with a lot of contemporary things happen. It's a very manageable sized city and you can travel from there easily. We have decided to do it this way because then our students also we find want to be together. They don't necessarily want to go. Some, some do want to go somewhere else, so that's a, we try to accommodate that when we can, but we really focus on this program. Constance just came back from her summer in Florence. Uh, and she's decided she needs to go again this fall <laughs> and, and the next summer again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm teasing. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a great thing for faculty too. So uh, we can all talk more about that as you want to know more about that. But it is for fall. Uh, our art studio students go and architecture, spring, communication design, uh, and um, the uh, illustration students, oh, sorry, fall fashion. It goes as well. And then summer, there's both art and architecture. Uh, so we can talk more about that if you have more questions. Uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on, we're really community-centric in our strategic plan. We think about three main areas, and I want you just to remember the three main areas, because I think they'll all be relevant to your thinking, but also to what your uh, students are going to face. Digital transformation, AI is going to change everything. It's a big disruptor. We're already engaged in, in that at the front end. In fact, we're uh, hiring a professorship in AI and design, and we're starting a new program in master design in that space. And our fastest growing program is human computing interaction, which Amy might talk more about. Then the second thing is everything about the climate environment, the built environment. How do we address a sustainable future? Uh, and that probably will involve both the technology and our ability to design that world uh, as well as uh, sustain it. And third, community. We believe that our job is also to be active in the community, support community. And we have amazing office of socially engaged practice with over 30 classes a year that have community partners. And these projects can range from being in the schools to uh, building parks in the city and try to create more equity across, across the board. So students want to do to get in the city, so that's an important piece. And we also have this really cool program called Fox Fridays. Now, this is the program you guys are all going to want to come back for. So <laughs> every Friday, we have a, a, a course that anyone in the university can take. And it's a different kind of studio course. Uh, this was last fall's. Uh, Jonathan Hanahan is the, uh, going to lead the fall program, along with Kelly Murphy for this year. And they're developing the, the fall program. This, so this was last fall's. It gives you an idea of the kinds of things. But students all over campus can come into the school and do these kind of uh, different courses uh, without credit, without cost. So it's an idea to generate interest around design and making for everyone and be very egalitarian. We also have an amazing press, which is a research press called Island Press, where we publish for visiting artists uh, that are nationally and internationally, are internationally and internationally renowned. Students work directly with the visiting artists, so it's a great opportunity for uh, those that are interested in studio art and interested in printmaking specifically. It happens to be my area, so I gave this a special focus <laughs> today. Uh, but uh, Lisa Belowski runs the press. Uh, it's, great it's a great opportunity. And finally, for my part today, I just want to talk about career engagement for a second. Really, it's mostly there. We are going through a fairly, well, we're going through a, a, a major rehaul of our career engagement uh, center uh, for the university, which we're part of. Uh, we have two amazing advisors already, Jen Meyer uh, in art 
and Seth Looper in architecture that will continue to be in those roles, but there's also a more expansive uh, approach to careers that will you'll be hearing more about. I'm not gonna get into too much detail today. But the other point I wanna make with this slide is this is one of the partners of Grafton Architects that won a Pritzker Award, and um, we have visiting artists constantly in here, architects, designers, uh, historians, theorists. I would just tell you, I'm gonna tell your students that uh, if you really wanna think about the opportunities for careers, one of the things to do is to be close up and, and get involved, to come to lectures and to encourage them to do that and to meet those people. As busy as they are, and they'll think they're too busy, uh, and they will be in some ways, but there are opportunities to meet leading uh, thinkers, designers, encourage them to go. It's, it's a big part of their education. So with that, without further ado, I wanna introduce my great colleague, Amy Hoft, who's going to come and talk about the College of Art. Amy has come up here, she is a sculptor of nationally and international uh, stature. She had a, um, a great one-person show at Mass Mocha, if you know that space, uh, recently, and she has been stewarding our program now for how many years? Four. Okay. Different, different uh, demeanor here. Okay, good morning. So happy to welcome all of you in person, finally. We're thrilled to have you and your child at WashU and in the Sam Fox School in particular. Ca um, Carmen introduced me. I'm the director of the College of Art and the Graduate School of Art. And in our college, we teach studio art and design. So let me first start by acknowledging what a great big deal it is to drop off your child for college and then drive away. <laughs> our aim today is to show you in what good hands you've left them. We take our responsibilities seriously and work really hard to generate a dynamic, challenging, and nurturing environment. I'm sure you're wondering how this is all gonna work, how your child will adapt. Here's something you've probably already noticed. Rather than calling your child your child, we've begun to refer to them as your student. So that's weird, but you gotta get used to it. Okay, that said, let's talk about how all this adapting is gonna go on. Let me say again how excited we are that your student has joined us. Our incoming class for the College of Art is comprised of 81 freshmen and six transfer students from all across America and three other countries, Thailand, South Korea, China and the USA. I promise you that we develop individual relationships with each and every student in the College of Art during their time with us. Faculty and staff get to know all of them, watching their development. Sometimes it literally feels like watching speeded up flowers bloom. They just get so much in the, in the four years in our small classes. Of course we know growth isn't easy, but I promise the rewards are enormous. By the time your student graduates, they'll have produced countless pieces of work, gained a tremendous skill set, and with that, a new deserved autonomy as an artist or designer and as a person. We're also excited about the setting of WashU in the heart of St. Louis at the center of the United States. We're surrounded by rich cultural opportunities, both contemporary and historical, not to mention gastronomical, Art institutions, including the Pulitzer, the Contemporary Art Museum, and the Laumeier Sculpture Park flourish alongside the Botanical Gardens, Cahokia Mounds, and the awesome design and engineering feat of the Gateway Art. We have established many ways for students and faculty to take advantage of the distinct nature of this area. Carmen was talking to you about some of that with our Office of Socially Engaged wow. Practice. I, I'll, I'll suggest also that you poke around on our website while you're here check out places and then pull up St. Louis. We've designed that as a, a tool for your student to use to mine while they're studying here. As your student begins their college experience, it's important to remember that transitions take time. Drawing classes, critiques, community projects, evening lectures, and rigorous grading may be new to some of them. However, what seems difficult in the first year will be much easier in the second and positively old hat by, the, by their senior year. 
Your student will be surrounded by a supportive and challenging peer group, instructed by caring experts in a setting with top rate facilities. I thought Carmen was gonna show our facilities, but maybe you get a tour, you probably see them. They'll surprise even themselves as to what they're capable. We so look forward to working with them in our classrooms and studios. It's a, it's a really exciting moment for Sam Fox and Wash U, and we can't wait to see what everyone makes. Now I wanna just talk a little bit about our curriculum. So this is the curriculum in the College of Art. We start them with a series of foundation courses in drawing, in digital media, and in two and three dimensional design. These courses introduce principles they'll need for advanced coursework, and then eventually to create independent work. These foundation courses literally function as the building blocks that support our students' eventual ability to function professionally. They also introduce the format and experience of the critique and college level grading. For a critique, your student will be, will um, present their finished work to be considered, discussed, and debated by their classmates and the instructor. At the foundation level, much of the work is by hand and some of it is digital. Marshalling a student's dexterity is a crucial goal. Principles of drawing and composition from the first year apply to advanced courses in topics as diverse as designing apps for the phone to building community-based sculptural installations. In their second year, students select their major, art or design, and from there, begin their individualized path through their selected curriculum. The assignment constraints in the third and fourth year eventually ease to allow for more independent work, and the curriculum is designed so they can tailor their interests directly into their major. And everything culminates in the professional presentation to, of their work in the senior shows. At this point, I want to just take a moment to talk about the challenge of learning to manage college level ambiguity. In typical math and science courses, students are asked to complete problem sets to work out the correct answers. In art and design critiques, we have, a, we have qualitative conversations in which faculty and students make judgments. Answers are less absolute and perspectives can be wide ranging. Students grow from learning to navigate and participate in these conversations. Again, it can take time for students to learn to manage that, that ambiguity, the ambiguity that correct may not be possible or even the goal. We advise students to stick with it, which is how they become astute observers, thinkers, speakers, and makers. They learn to be constructive in a community studio environment, an invaluable skill set. In fact, I'd go as far to say that among the many valuable skills learned in college, the critical acumen developed through the critiquing process is likely the most valuable life skill students walk away from art school with. This analytical ability is in short supply and valued in all work environments. Additionally, they become discerning visual thinkers, another rare commodity in the workforce. Students often receive faculty feedback that may lead to remaking something, sometimes even starting over. This feedback is an opportunity for students to learn a primary aspect of the art and design process, becoming a generator of many ideas and possibilities, and then an excellent editor of those ideas is as important as making one masterful thing. We are teaching them to be fearless in thinking about what is possible. We know it's hard, but we're here to help. Faculty ev evaluate students for their individual progress and effort in relation to their peers and to professional standards. We value the development of independence, intellectual rigor, self-discipline, dexterity, motivation, authorship, resiliency, and the ability to work in a community, community studio setting. These skills and qualities, along with the production of strong visual work, are crucial for a successful career in college and beyond. Our standards for grades are high. That said, it's important to remember that success often starts with failure. A project that flops or a course that doesn't quite work out does not mean that your student is in the wrong place or will not make a first-rate designer or artist. I encourage you to take grades with a grain of salt and to encourage your students to do the same. In art and design, the work that gets made, the portfolio that gets created, matters a great deal more than the grade. Working hard and investing fully is what matters. I thought it important to describe some of these teaching techniques so you too might be able to help your student through their college experience. Now let me briefly tell you about our two majors. 
Studio art is where they can study painting, photography, printmaking, sculpture, and time-based media, or some combination of those things. The program is chaired by Professor Megan Kirkwood, a photographer who in her own work uses landscape imagery as a means to inform land use and infrastructure decisions. Megan, can you stand up so the parents know who you are? Thank you. And design is where they can study graphic design, illustration, interaction design, and fashion, or some combination thereof. This program is chaired by Professor Aggie Toppins, who, as she likes to say, teaches, makes, and writes about graphic design. Aggie, can you stand up to introduce yourself? Thank you. We also offer, as Carmen mentioned, uh, a minor in human-computer interaction, super popular minor that attracts students from, um, from uh, computer science as well as arts and sciences, and, and another minor in creative practice for social change. Let me take a minute to talk about what your child's professional future might look like. Sam Fox students are special. They're smart, talented, and creative, and that creative part is like a superpower in the workforce. Most will become artists and designers. Some may work in arts adjacent careers, as for instance, arts administrators or perhaps arts editors. We have alumni who are independent contractors as artists or illustrators or photographers and so on. We have alumni working for Google, for Pixar, for Instagram. Some who are set designers, hair accessory designers, book designers, editorial page designers. And we have alumni working for fashion designers, artists, museums, and nonprofit arts institutions. We have alumni running arts institutions, curating exhibitions. We have alumni making all kinds of art and design. But most important, we have alumni who are excited and gratified by their working lives and what they contribute to our culture. I could go on, but I won't. I'm gonna wrap it up there. There's time for questions after. Thank you for your attention. Now I'm introducing my colleague, Constance Vale who is the chair of undergraduate architecture. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to welcome you here to Wash U, to St. Louis, um, and to welcome your incredibly talented students uh, joining us here at Wash U this semester for the next uh, four years of their undergraduate education. Um, I'd like to begin by sharing a short introduction I prepared for our forthcoming issue of Approach, our undergraduate student work publication in architecture. The theme of that publication is agency, and that was selected by our student editors uh, that collaborated with me on the publication and speaks to building the future through students' agency in their education and architecture's agency in the world. I'll begin by sharing a quote from American journalist Sidney J. Harris. The whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows. How do we prepare for the future? We cannot mimetically reflect what already exists, see only the familiar, or look solely to our own knowledge. To imagine, to create, to really innovate requires turning mirrors into windows projecting possibilities of what might be, opening up to new ideas, framing a view not just of ourselves, but of others. As architects, it is our task to envision other worlds, to account for different perspectives, and act as agents of change. The College of Architecture at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis believes in the profound agency of architecture in the world. The role of the architect extends far beyond the creation of built work that simply mirrors the past or the present. Architecture encompasses looking ahead to transform practice and theory by assessing the broader implications of our designs. In this way, we're positioned to shape not only the built environment, but also culture itself. Architects can and should challenge prevailing norms question established practices and drive innovation that 
addresses today's most complex challenges. To prepare students for building the future, our curriculum recognizes the intrinsic importance of students' agency in their own education. This upcoming volume of approach embodies its topical focus on agency, as I noted, in that our theme was selected by our student editors, the first in the history of our architecture student work publications, to my knowledge, to have uh, these students participating in the production of the journal. Um, those include Carlos Cepeda, uh, Connor Merritt, who's actually pictured here, um, Chuchu Ki, Alexis Williams, Bowler Wu, and Jack Zhang. Uh, this directly illustrates the student bodies, your students, um, pivotal engagement as contributors to academic discourse and school culture. Along with these student editors, each of our students, faculty, and staff form our school's culture by contributing to our collaborative, diverse, inclusive, and supportive learning environment. The slides I'll show in a second are drawn from this upcoming issue of Approach Agency and frame non-linear views of foundational and advanced coursework, providing a sense of the atmosphere of creative energy at the College of Architecture. The five sections focus on key research areas prioritized in our curriculum, environment, technology, society, material, and culture. The first three, environment, technology, and society, and they appear in slightly different order, I apologize for that, um, form the basis of our core studio sequence. So I'll point those out when they appear. Students focus first on environmental concerns in their first year, uh, starting in the very first studio that they will begin in just one week, beginning to address issues of climate, a vast array of life forms, and designing with ecological concerns in mind. Other studios that we've run in the past include Solar Decathlon, uh, this an occupational therapy center that's being built here in St. Louis uh, by working with Professor Hong Shi Yin, who's leading that um, academic project. Uh, as well as uh, ceramic 3D printing and innovative facade design with Professor uh, Kelly Van Dyke Murphy uh, that you can see here who visited Chicago with her studio. Fabrication in courses like furniture design which is taught with faculty Lindsay Stouffer who actually teaches across art and uh, architecture but is in fact an artist um, and this is one of our architecture students studying with her to speak to our very interdisciplinary nature. Um, we also have classes like fabricated drawings where students make, use advanced uh, digital fabrication tools with Professor Chandler Ahrens and explore tectonic systems. Or design inflatable furniture with Professor of Practice Nanako Umamoto and here you can see a piano in <laughs> absolute uh, beautiful explosion on the left. Yes. Um, <laughs> that forms the basis of then the inflatable furniture's design um, or culture. Uh, and in that you can see the second year core studio that focuses on uh, art gallery in Cherokee Street. Um, these kind of uh, facilities that the students might then go and interact with on a field trip in the neighborhood or um, in the other second year studio where they'll travis, travel to Columbus, Indiana. Uh, <clears throat> travel to Florence, as Carmen already mentioned, to work with uh, professors like Robert McCarter on the design of a Montessori school, um, or addressing social justice challenges in studios like this one, designing a museum to house the Clotilda slave ship with Professor John Hole. Society, uh, tower, uh, housing tower that they produce in their third year, thinking about complex challenges around housing um, that travels to the city of Chicago to look at skyscrapers that have uh, formed the basis of um, the development of sh uh, skyscrapers across the country and the world. Um, they ask questions about bodily autonomy and cast uh, metal in the foundry, potentially, if they take an elective called Body as Sight, Jewelry as Architecture with me. Um, they participate in weekend charrettes, like a house is a hat, uh, with Yasmin Vobis. Um, our charrettes are a real pleasure, and we have two that they can participate in, uh, actually one even twice during their time here, um, and they're tremendous fun. Uh, and then technology, 
um, looking at things like game design with faculty from across architecture, art, film, and media studies, uh, looking at AI in design processes with faculty like Shivari Mahatar who are working with AI tools um, or AI artificial intelligence in space uh, with faculty like myself who research um, autonomous vehicles and smart cities and think about how those impact the built environment. Oops, sorry. Um, so returning to the conclusion uh, of my thoughts on architecture's role, our curriculum is intended to empower students to be the architects of their own education. They first survey the field in core studios, ecology, history, theory, and technology and representation courses. Then they take on increased agency in these advanced topic courses, which were intermingled. Uh, the electives further hone, these advanced topic studios and electives further hone their transdisciplinary expertise, and they can select a focus that hones in on that particular topic area. We also offer minors in history and theory, landscape architecture and urban design, and many of our students uh, even take majors or minors across campus. By blending disciplinary and transdisciplinary outlooks, our curriculum prepares students to contribute to refining, redefining architecture's role in the world. Such disciplinary expansion is crucial as many of the most challenging problems of our time, climate change, technological ethics, and social injustice are so complex that they require multiple intelligences and robust collaborations. Our faculty encourage the curiosity required to foster new knowledge by providing students with the tools to seek information and the confidence that the mystery of what they're searching for is far more interesting than anything they already know. Our comprehensive foundational architecture curriculum paired with transdisciplinary perspectives prepares our students to be leaders, not mirroring the world as it is, but opening windows to see what it can become. Many of our students go on to enter traditional architecture practice, working from within the discipline to determine its future, while others draw on the spatial thinking and creative problem solving that they hone during their time in their education to pursue a diverse range of creative practices. <clears throat> Thus expanding architecture's influence and pushing the field in new directions. We have complete confidence that our graduates, those joining us in this class, your students, those before and those to come will play a vital role in changing the world for the better as they go on to build the future. Thank you. And it is my pleasure to welcome up to the podium Joseph Fitzpatrick, Associate Dean of Students. Thank you, Constance. So I love being able to go last after you have now heard the amazing education that we have here. I've been in student affairs or student life or student services, whatever you call it, for over 20 years. And very early in my career, I was given some advice, always try to work for schools where you would have wanted to attend as a student. And I can say completely, I would have loved to attend WashU as a student. I'm gonna let you know a secret. It's not really a secret. We have some of the best faculty in the entire world. They're some of the most creative, some of the most intelligent, um, some of the most accomplished that you'll ever come across. But what they also are is incredibly approachable because not only are they accomplished practitioners, but they've decided to make a life where they can unlock the potential of those who are coming behind them. So who wouldn't want to do student support in an environment like that? So as you think about the education that your student's gonna go through, we wanna to touch on briefly here some of the support resources to help them be successful. So the first part is we have two four-year advisors. I am one of them. The other one is John Early. If you can't tell, John has more hair than I do. So that's how you can tell us apart. So the two of us have been working with your students all summer. We've done some group advising sessions. We've done individual advising sessions. So we're their core advisor for the next four years of their journey here. We help them choose their classes, make sure that they're on uh, the schedule they need to be. And at some point, we're gonna hand them off to a faculty advisor in their second year so that then they're gonna have two advisors to help them on this journey. 
as the advisors, we're also there to connect them to all the different resources that we have available. So when we're supporting academic success for our students, it falls into two broad categories, academic support services and then mental health resources or other personal resources. So on the academic resource side, the first part, as I said, primary resource is their four-year advisor. Also, we want students to take advantage of fa faculty office hours. And office hours is a very broad term. It doesn't mean what it was when I was going to school, or maybe some of you. It might be digital office hours. But in part of their syllabus, part of the information they're going to give in their classes is how to get a hold of them, how to interact with them so that students who are maybe having a difficult time with a concept or struggling a little bit connect with the faculty member. Then Washington University is this wonderful combination of large and small at the same time. It's one of the reasons that I wanted to work here. You get all of the resources of a large university, which is where it comes into things like the Learning Center and the Writing Center and the Disability Resources that are available to all students across the entire university. At the same time that we are this small environment within the Sam Fox School, which means that we will know your student. Your faculty members are going to know them, they're going to know their work, I'm going to know them, their four-year advisor is going to know them, the registrar is going to know them. The, the way that they will be known on campus means they can't disappear. We're able to see when students are in distress and try to do interventions at those times. So I know that throughout the summer you have been receiving newsletters as well as your students about resources on campus. You've spent some time on our websites. You've probably been to some resource fairs since you've been here this weekend. So these are things hopefully that you've heard before, where the Learning Center is the place you go for peer tutoring, for time management workshops. Uh, the Writing Center is where they go because all of our students across the university have to take college writing as part of their curriculum. And so we're not, uh, I'm sorry, that resource is there to assist them to broaden their ability as a writer. Disability resources being available for those that may need those kind of accommodations. So I'm not asking you to remember this list that's here two months from now. What I'm asking you to remember is that we have academic resources and we have lots of options available that we try to tailor to the individual student. And so that if you do come across them starting to stumble, is that you can go back to the website, you can go back to those resources, and you can reach out to us and say, hey, how can we assist my student who's having this issue? Then we also have this long list of mental health resources, and this is just a sampling. The most important one being the Habeth Health and Wellness Center, which is both your physical and your mental health support services. But they have additional things for students, such as a timely care app that they can download. They are going to have heard about this leading up to it, during orientation, and over the next few weeks. The, the real spirit of orientation is orienting, reorienting, and reorienting again. Because oftentimes, the resources, you're like, okay, I hear it but when I most need it is two months down the road or three months down the road. So that's why we do this sort of wave of bringing information back. There's also peer counseling options and then there's also options for students that maybe encounter some of the more difficult things within relationship to sexual violence prevention center. So once again, walk away knowing not this list, but that there are these different types of resources available so that if you encounter that. So I wanna talk a minute about partnering with you. So I was the little kid who would run around pretending to be a plane. And so I've taken this uh, metaphor as far as I can in my career. So the idea here is that your student is going on a, on a journey right now. The traffic control, mission, critical, home base, that's you. You have prepared them up to this point with everything you've done. You've sent them to flight school. You've prepared them to get to this point. And now, as they embark on their journey at college, they gotta fly the plane. The third element of that is the navigators. That's us, that's their support structure. So the key here is, you can't fly the plane for them. No matter how much you're gonna want to, you can't fly the plane for them. They have to fly the plane. And that's what this is, is about a journey where we set the destination, we figure out how we're gonna get there, and then they're the one that's gonna fly it. So that's you back home, if that's down the street, if you're here in St. Louis, or if that's in another country. But the wonderful thing about modern communications is that you can stay in almost constant radio contact with them today, so that you can be checking in. You can see how that's going. 
And then we're there with them. We're the compass, we're the map, we're all those tools trying to say, hey, there's some rough weather ahead. Hey, we need to go this way instead. And as much as we may want to, we can't fly the plane for them either. So sometimes that's going to be a very smooth journey, and sometimes I'm going to be holding on for dear life with your student. <laughs> so you know your student best. And so that's why you have these important checkpoints that are going to come along the way as you're checking in with them remotely or when they come back for the holidays, when there's in the breaks in between the semesters. That's when you want to recollect each time, and that's when you want to revisit these different uh, resources. So the last piece, you see that quote up there, and I want you all to say it with me. What are you going to do about that? Okay. So this one, you're going to get a panic text or a phone call or a FaceTime or something. It's guaranteed. It's probably going to come at 3 in the morning when they're in the middle of studio or they got a big test the next day or those sort of things. So one of the first things I want you to do when you get that is whatever your version of affirmation for your student is, do that. I love you, I support you, I believe in you. Then the, once you've listened to them, the first thing I want you to say back, what are you going to do about that? I want you to empower them to be part of the solution, not try to automatically fix it for them. Now, do everything you do as a parent, though. Guide them, question them. Are you sure about that? What about this other option? Those sort of things. But the first thing is, what are you going to do about that? Because they have to fly the plane. And so what that means is, that might mean them remembering, oh, I need to go talk to my advisor. Oh, I need to reach out to my faculty member. You know what? I do need to set up a counseling appointment. Oh, you know, I do need to go to sleep. Any number of those things that need to happen. So then, if you have that conversation with them, what are you going to do about that? And then they give you a really good answer about what they've done about it, and they run into some problems, that's when you can then reach out to us. I'm not trying to say don't reach out to us by any stretch of the imagination. We want to hear from you as well. But we want to be part of finding a solution when the student has already been engaging in it so that we're working with them together. Can we all agree to that? OK, one more time. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> Okay, now say it kind of groggy because it's 3 in the morning. Wait, wait, what are you going to do about that? Okay, good, good. So my last thing is I want you to encourage your student to get engaged because in addition to being successful academically, it's the important social aspects of being at college. So there are so many amazing ways to get involved. And so on uh, the left hand for you is the Sam Fox School. We ourselves have a number of student uh, activities and events and groups. The top two are bolded. Those are the two primary ones. That's your Architecture Student Council and your Art Council, or ASC and Art Co for short. Those are the primary because not only are they creating activities and events, they're also one of the formal ways by which students give feedback to the administration about the student experience within each of the schools. So those students are the ones that um, participate in our broader conversations about what that environment and learning environment and where are some pros and cons and how can we improve and those sort of things. We open that up widely too for students in regular town halls that we encourage them all to come to to give voice to their experience. Then we have also a number of clubs down there, and we didn't list them all because there's not enough room on one slide, but um, for different affinity groups or specializations or professional organizations. These are going to be introduced to them over the next couple weeks. Then on the right-hand side, which has already been introduced to them in other ways and at resource fairs and will continue to be, is there's over 400 student groups on this campus for them to join. There are residence hall events that, that will be offered for them if they live on campus. They can attend athletic events. They can go to the theater productions. There will be public lecture series and screenings. We do an amazing series of these ourselves, but so do the other schools on campus that they can go to to broaden that. They can also get out and explore St. Louis. So the last part there, tomorrow we're going to get in front of your student and do a different version of this. But I'm going to issue them a 30-day challenge. And the 30-day challenge is introduce yourself to one new person every day for 30 days. So as a new student coming in, if they do that, by the end of 30 days, they will have already started to create a community and a support structure around them that's going to become important to them succeeding over the next four years. 
Now some of you, you know your student best, and some of you are like, well, my extroverted student's already done that. <laughs> so challenge them to try to get outside of maybe the immediate circle. And for those introverted students that you have, and you're saying, well, that's gonna be torture for them. I was an introverted student when I started college. And today I'm sitting here as an associate dean of students and have been doing this for over 20 years. And it was all because somebody 20 years ago said, Joseph, for 30 days, introduce yourself to one person and see what happens at the end of that. All right, thank you everyone. We're gonna open up for Q&A. Thank you. Well, you can see how dedicated our faculty and staff are to your students, and, um, and uh, I know they're gonna have a great experience, but now we wanna open up to questions that you might have. One I got already, I'm gonna answer publicly, was that to get things started was the idea of a, the difference between a BS and a BA in architecture. I can answer it actually, but I have uh, Constance here, and I'm gonna start, okay, she's gonna do it. And also uh, talk about what that means in terms of uh, getting a, a master's degree as well. Uh, so concerning the BA or the BS in architecture, the decision is not something that students need to make in their first year. Um, so take your time, work with your advisor uh, in honing a decision. But the real distinction is that the BS involves more building technology courses that better equip students to enter a graduate program with advanced standing. And the BA gives uh, students greater freedom and uh, breadth of elective courses that they can take. So the final year, uh, in their fourth year, not only do they not have to take two additional option studios and two or three technology courses, building technology courses, they can have basically just their senior capstone if they've completed all their other requirements and an entire year of electives. So it really depends on your topical interest, how deeply you want to explore architecture. The BS prepares you best for a master's program. The BA better for more of an interdisciplinary pursuit. Let's say if you're taking one of our landscape architecture or urban design minors and planning to pursue one of those, or another field uh, entirely. Um, and then ultimately, the BA also is a pathway to a master's degree. Doesn't hurt you, you just have completed fewer of the requirements. You're maybe less likely to get advanced standing in a program, but uh, that's not an issue for entering graduate school. Okay, other questions? I'm gonna run the mic around so we can hear the questions since we are recording or I'll repeat them. Any questions? All right, oh, I got a bunch, I'm gonna get, you. and then you. Can you describe the studio culture, um, also the perception of uh, late nights and uh, mental health and the fact that that's maybe improving a little bit over time in, in uh, design schools overall and what you're doing about that? That's a great question, who wants to take that one on? Is that, is <laughs> Is that, is that you, Constance, or is that you, Amy? Maybe hear it from the art and the design and the architecture side. Maybe design, too, and Aggie could start. We'll introduce Aggie. Come on. She loves St. Louis. Look. Hi, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, I'm Aggie, and I'm the chair of design, so that's fashion design and communication design. The first thing I'll say is we do close the building. So we do encourage our students that way to go home and get some sleep. But I think in different ways, um, t mental health and physical health is top of mind for all of us. And I know that I, when I'm teaching, I'm always reminding my students to sleep and eat. I think it's something we, we all reinforce in a micro way uh, with our interactions. But um, so there are, there are some uh, you know, rules like you have to go home at a certain time. Um, but I think another um, part of this answer is the studio culture bit. So um, um, after uh, the sophomore year, students get their own space to work in, in comdes and in fashion. Um, and they, uh, sometimes they don't use them as much as we wish they would, to be honest. So that's another thing I would love to uh, encourage is use the studio because first of all, it helps you get more feedback and you build relationships. Like Joseph said, that's really important in college. Your classmates, we would say to our students, 
um, are, is your future, that's your network. It's like your first network. So uh, getting to know one another's work is really important. Investing in one another's work is really important. It makes the classroom experience better, and it makes the quality of the work better, and the quality of college better. Um, but that said, go home and sleep sometimes. Um, the other thing I'll say is studio culture helps build relationships with the faculty too. So, um, and sometimes we surprise them with pizza. So, so you know, it, it's one of those things where studio culture is part of preparing for the profession as much as it is having a great uh, college experience too because studio culture is how the, um, the profession works in fashion as well as all the various Comdes jobs which we'll talk about tomorrow with your students. But I hope that is a good start for Comdes in fashion. I'll add, because I agree with everything Aggie said, um, I will add that our students uh, have an amazing uh, respect for, care for one another in excess of anywhere that I've taught or studied myself before. Um, it's something that I value extraordinarily highly about the school, um, that it is such a collaborative, it's, the students are ambitious, don't get me wrong, but they are not cutthroat. They are kind and caring to one another, and that has been my experience. I'm not one of the students, I don't have the first-hand experience, but from the place that I sit as faculty, I see them as really investing in making sure one another are doing well um, and trying to be, grow the, the sort of collective spirit of their class to be healthy and uh, compassionate. The faculty, too, are very invested in our students and, you know, to see us as collaborators with them on uh, making sure that they're healthy and okay in the ways that we can as faculty in being able to say, please, you know, go home and go to sleep, listen to me, <laughs> begging you. Um, that's, that's really important. If any way you can help us <laughs> from your communications, your radio communications to make that, uh, you know, case for, for self-care is extraordinarily helpful. Um, and additionally, uh, I agree with the work in studio is such an important thing. Architecture can be incredibly isolating uh, and scary if you do it on your own. I know, I've tried it um, <laughs> at myself as an undergraduate. Uh, and when you work away from the studio, one, you don't limit your hours. You're working all the time. Two, <laughs> you tend to think that everybody's doing some project that's 10 times greater than yours because you can't see them. But actually, if you're in the room, you can see them and they're all, oh, mine looks good. Mine looks like, like everyone else's. <laughs> um, so that ability to be able to sort of be in a collective during the day, during the daytime hours. Um, that's a really helpful part of, and having that network of people that you can lean on then, your colleagues to say, wow, am I stressed? I don't know how I'm gonna get this done. What should we do? Um, and being able to think through that together. Yeah, and tell them to ask us, always come to the faculty. If they are stressed about a deadline, we wanna help. Anybody else wanna? Um, yeah, so just to kind of add to what my colleagues have already said, I think in studio art, something that we, you know, that we really try to think about in talking with our students is that we're interested in how they are working through their projects, right? It's not that we want to see a solution be something that they come at by just digging themselves into the ground for 10 hours, like it's a big game of misery poker, right? We want them to be thinking about getting to a new solution, a new place in their work through creative and, or creative thinking and through, um, and through their own individual problem solving. I do think there is a role for studio art, you know, in particular, to get really excited about something, right? And to have a student say, hey, you know what? I really want to see how big of a painting I can make and have it complement my work and challenge me. And I want to see if I can even fit it in my studio. And there might be some nights that I decide to work through the night to do that. That's a different type of, hey, let's like really go for it. Let's see how hard we can work. Let's see what you can do um, and where you can get to, right? So in studio art, we really think about the difference between maybe a student driven, like let's just really see what we can do. Um, let's challenge ourselves versus a, like this is only going to be something that you get to and that you can achieve um, what you need to by, by working five nights in a row. I'm gonna add one quick thing in that. Just, um, and that's just to say, we do have a lot of resources for, for mental health in, um, in the school if, if that is something that your student needs. So we have drop-in sessions and then we have, um, actually you can just uh, go online and get help rather immediately, just talking help rather immediately. 
So we do have a lot of um, those kinds of solutions as well. Okay. I'm just gonna add one thing as an artist. It, it takes time to make things and usually they love the time that they spend making things. So even though they might complain about being late in long hours, they're also, there's a lot of joy in that process too, but I think all the answers were great and it's, it's a great question because we have been working on it uh, collectively as you can see, so, so thank you. So you mentioned how uh, you incorporate AI into the design process in some cases, and I'm just curious how, what's your sort of perception of the future of architecture in particular, because we have an architecture student. It, what, what, the, what impact will AI have on that design process? Well, great question, and we're tackling it um, head on as much as possible. I'm gonna say a couple of words, and I'm gonna give Constance a chance. We, um, for one thing, the language-based modeling now is really general AI has taken over and whether it's chat GPT or all of the programs that we're using or some of us are already using. I'm using it in the studio to explore it myself. Uh, Constance has been using it before the explosion and she'll talk about we, we as I mentioned, we have uh, an interesting moment where uh, once the language-based models have come out, you know, in the creative field, there's a great opportunity to, to use it, to speculate, to design, you know, whether you're using Midjourney or Dolly 2. I think Midjourney is a more interesting one, and there's others. Um, but uh, it's something we see as a tool head-on. It's a disruptor. It's more than a tool, and I think we've said that about other things, even the web or, uh, you know, uh, it can be used for good. It could be used for evil, just like any, anything else, so there's a lot to be concerned about, what it's going to do, what it's going to change, uh, jobs, the economy, uh, and also, uh, you know, how we generally, our sense of humanity as well. So in the arts, I think we t can tackle it directly. I don't think we're uh, going to be afraid of it as much as we are gonna take seriously the potential threats of it. At the same time, we're not throwing drawing away. We're not throwing the disciplinary aspects of things, as you can see, and I was talking some about the models in there. Even as we incorporate new technology, we create, you know, we, we, we continue to, to, to really uh, have very uh, strong emphasis on skills, on craft, on drawing, on model making, and those types of things. So I think we're in a good position as an institution. The chancellor wants to ta tackle it head on. We have a professorship that was just created by uh, Christian Kav Kavita Bharat. Uh, their daughter Mira just graduated. Mira just graduated in architecture program. Uh, he's at Google, he's a head scientist there. We've been developing uh, a program. We had an AI plus design symposium that's on our website that you can listen to. Uh, it happened in the spring. We have an AI professor that, we're, uh, that we'll be hiring at a high level this, uh, this year, headed by Chandler Sharon, uh, Chandler Aarons, one of our um, architecture faculty who's also exploring it as well. But Constance is really ahead of the curve. Uh, she's been using it in her work, as she said, with the autonomous car, collaborating with engineering as well. And in design, just before I turn it over, we're Jonathan Hanahan, who runs the HCI program and also the Fox Friday program, by the way. He has started the Human Computing Interaction Program, and they've been doing coding and, and AI-related stuff for some a number of years now. It's just that now it's much more in the, you know, the canon and everyone is talking about it. And we are starting a master of design that works around the interaction interface between machines and computers, if you will. So computing uh, focus. And I'll just add a few words, um, since Carmen did a beautiful job covering all of that. Um, that is to say, we've had lots of, you know, technological, uh, introductions in architecture, think of AutoCAD many years ago and the sort of tumult <laughs> that that caused in the field um, and the concerns around what are we gonna do? We're gonna have all this time. Uh, and <laughs> I have less time, I'm sure, than any architect before. I don't know how this happens. Um, but I think the, the idea of new tools being introduced is that we need to think how to implement them. It is a very powerful super tool that we can think of as more than that. Um, in fact, it could be, uh, and Autodesk is certainly one of many uh, looking into models for using AI to say, do all the code checking in your drawings. Like you are not going to have to 
tediously check the width of a hallway or the swing of a door uh, or the space around a toilet, you might just have that sort of implemented through the software that you're using. Larger scale ways to think about this is that it's coming in and doing much of the design work. It, it is that uh, idea that these autonomous agents are being led. Let's say you have uh, the plow as uh, being pulled by a, a horse or the plow is being pushed by yourself. I think that's some of the, some of the distinction that in fact uh, by helping to make judgments, uh, you know, AI can do some of the most abhorrent uh, image making. It can make some really unhelpful uh, designs. Um, and by having this long-standing discourse in architecture, we're able to produce a little uh, guidance. Um, so being able to use those tools, having the uh, ability to navigate them, and being trained to be a leader, a thinker, a creative thinker, uh, will protect them in a job market that could have significant changes taking place in it. Um, I think those are the, the key things we're thinking about and how, how we can really make that uh, part of the curriculum so that they're not surprised by it. Those are some great answers. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I'm going to add, you know, I keep thinking about how fortunate that your students are coming into the university at a time when this is happening. There's no better environment than a university to be in that's all going to be tackling this from an interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, even though we tend to worry about <laughs> the other issues, you know, about plagiarism and stuff, that's the kind of, you know, that's, that's going to go away pretty quickly, like calculators, you know, we, we don't. I think there's, I have one back here and then I'm going to come over, yeah. Oh, here first. Hi, I had an architecture two-prong question. First was, I've, I've heard that um, summer internships are a little difficult to get in the architecture space, um, especially for younger students, um, like first or second year, because they don't have as much experience. So I was just trying to figure out in terms of like career um, placement and how um, the career services are able to help with like summer internships in the actual field of architecture, as I've heard that like, unless you know somebody who's an architect and you could work at, you know, friend's firm, then it's hard. Um, the second question is if uh, you, if a student wants to pursue the master's program, um, is there like a different track than like the normal applicant coming off the street that didn't go to Wash U for undergraduate? Constance, I'm gonna give you some work again, uh, but, but Constance being, you know, working with the students, uh, you know, I'll let her answer first and see because she has more direct experience with the undergraduates and then we can talk about it. Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I want to start with the graduate program. We have a four plus two uh, education, meaning that if the students determine to stay at Wash U, uh, they would have a two-year graduate program pathway. Um, being that we have a BA or a BS, um, that is actually a pretty significant reduction in time as compared to most other schools that they would be looking at. Um, so that two years would be three years at most other institutions. Um, depending on if they get advanced standing, they could possibly chip away from that. But generally speaking, and even three and a half years, I think it, it still is at the GSD, uh, for example. So I think our... our Education uh, is really excellent at the graduate level, and it's something to consider um, as they go forward towards their graduate education, uh, whether it be in architecture, landscape architecture, or urban design. Um, that's point one. Point two? Internships. internships, right. Um, so Seth Looper is excellent. He has uh, not only experience uh, with architecture as a field, but also the film industry and other areas. Um, and he's been working very closely with the students on their portfolios, uh, their CVs. All of their advisors are also help, happy to help them producing those kind of materials. Um, and we've also introduced an uncapped portfolio design course in undergraduate architecture to help support any time they need to do that because usually it's on top of everything else that they're doing that they're developing this portfolio. Um, in terms of the uh, placement with jobs, yes, it's challenging to get a job sometimes. It really depends on what's going on in the world and how many architecture jobs are out there in part. Um, but 
we want to be as supportive and helpful in pursuing those internship pathways as we can. Um, so they should reach out to and speak to their advisor, their faculty, ask for help, definitely work with Seth and career services. Um, and furthermore, I'm so excited. We have a student who's uh, actually going to be working at OMA this semester, just learned about a few days ago. So the job market right now, I would say, is excellent for an undergrad uh, that's in their, entering their senior year to take a semester off to do this kind of internship is quite unusual. And it's one of the, I mean, it's another Pritzker Prize winning office. It's remarkable. So that's an example. Um, just popped into my head because he was out there setting up the approach exhibition that we can see uh, in the gallery space. Um, can I just, I'll just finish the architecture and I'll give it to you. I, I, I wanted to add a couple of things just in the way that I have experienced it with our students. So, so a lot of what you were inferring that, you know, at what point are they likely to get an internship? It's probably not after their second year that they're gonna really get a good placement, but probably closer to after their third year that we typically find. We also don't overemphasize that they get it after the second year because they're only in, you know, they don't have, it's a lot to onboard. It's a big investment for an architecture firm to onboard. It's a good time if they wanna do summer Florence or do something else. They don't, don't feel too worried about it because your anxiety will create anxiety in them. My daughter is an architect too, so I can speak with a little bit of confidence, like personal, like you guys are parents to watch this happen. There's time for it to develop. But a number of other things you did say are true. Having faculty that have connections, I've helped students find their internship partner through the alumni network that we have. Faculty can do the same. Make sure that they're proactive. It sort of goes along with what Joseph was saying. Uh, don't have them debate it with you or explore, over explore it with you, have them do it with us, have them go to Seth, have them come to me even, or have them go to Constance because they often get discouraged and they don't, they're not going about it the right way. And if they don't have the right portfolio, or they don't have enough experience, it's a big investment from a firm's point of view. So there, but everything you said is actually pretty much the right characterization. It's you need to know people, you need to know what the firm's doing, you need to know what they're looking for, the connections help, all of those things are true. That's the world as we know it, and we're part of that, and we try to be supportive of it. But the main thing is have them be proactive, not reactive. Have them come and talk to us if they're not having success. And use the career staff, Seth Looper, in this case, architecture, Jen Meyer, and art. They'll, be, they'll go way, way out of their way to help and, and advise, not only on the internship, but what's the next, next move. An annual career fair. I want to add one more thing because it's come up now again, is we also are interested, we have been admitting students from our undergraduate program, even though they get into anywhere they apply, believe me, in, in architecture they go all the top uh, programs in art as well. We also, uh, you know, in, embrace the idea that our students too can do a BS and come into our graduate program and MARC too as well. I just wanted to um, answer the question in relation to design and art. So um, Jen Meyer, who was just mentioned, she's the, the career counselor for design and art. She has this incredible um, spreadsheet of alumni and connections to all of them. She stays very connected to them and makes uh, uh, opportunities for internships with, for our students. And like in architecture, they don't do it until they're like between their junior and senior year kind of a thing. It's, it's not a thing that you do uh, when you don't have any experience. So, um, so, so to get that professional experience, you have to have some experience under your belt. But, um, I, and I would say actually over the COVID period, we ramped that up in a, a really big way, um, the connections to our alumni. So they just need to go and talk to their, um, their career counselors about stuff like this and, and their faculty. I've got, I know we're here, right? Weren't you doing? Are you, are you just advocating for someone else? No, no, no. Uh, thank you. Um, mine is just a very quick, short logistical question, and I understand the buildings close at night, but because the school is further, I think, east than the South 40, I was just curious about transportation and safety as they go back, from, back and forth with long hours. Is it, Joseph, you want to do this one? So a couple things. Um, 
over the course of the next few days, your student's going to be introduced to a wide range of not just transportation, but also just safety and uh, the importance of being part of that member of the community. So traveling back and forth between campus, there is shuttle service that runs uh, around campus. And then also at night when students have concern, they also can reach out to Wash UPD or, uh, and if they have concern about getting from location to location um, to inquire about uh, escort for those sort of things too late at night. And then you might notice around campus there's blue lights all over, which is also just another safety feature for students. And so anytime they have a concern, they can access those and that goes immediately to dispatch at WashU PD. And so then there are also apps that the students can download which have safety information on there and ways for them to connect immediately to that. So. Um, Whenever looking at a campus community, we are essentially a small, uh, small city. And so that is to say, we are relatively safe, but we tell all students that you have to participate in your own safety. So that is that self-awareness, that is letting people know where you are, traveling in groups. It's a lot of that common sense sort of piece. And so since there are students traveling to the South 40 where the residence halls are and over here, they're doing it together. They're, they're in classes together, those sort of things. And so that's part of that building that community and knowing who lives where. Because that's probably the safest, is always to make sure that you have people know where you're going, where you're starting, and those sort of things. Um, much more of that's gonna be introduced to them over the course of orientation. Some of it's probably already started. They're gonna have floor meetings in the residence halls. They're gonna have sessions with a WashU PD. So I don't wanna repeat every single thing that's gonna thing, but they're gonna bring them through all of that sort of pieces. Thanks, Joseph, and yeah, okay. And then I'll back, come back here. I just have a quick question. Um, uh, did students, or what percentage of students are students encouraged to minor, either double major or minor in something that's not art related, so that it doesn't completely dominate their lives? <laughs> well, um, I'm not sure who wants to answer, but I'll start the question, then give it to Amy. Um, you know, because we, we've done a lot of work on our, uh, so we encourage students to pursue the things that they're truly genuinely interested in. We try to build into the curriculum that we have now a lot of flexibility so they can do so, but we don't you know, try to hype up the idea that they should have two majors for the sake of having two majors, uh, but, but we do try to give and promote the interdisciplinary, so uh, I'll let Amy talk about that. One of the, one of the assets of this university is that it's a research university and the, um, the subject matter is open to the students across, across the university. And they can use that information in the, in the production of their work. The, we, our students are so ambitious that they often think they need to major in the thing they're interested in, in addition to being an artist or an architect or a designer. Um, and that, that's their first go-to, is that they're gonna double major. And I'm gonna tell you that 70% of our students either double major or minor. And um, I, I'm gonna just recommend that you recommend that they minor, so that they can really concentrate on the thing they came here to do. Um, but it's not gonna work, but that's what I'm just gonna recommend. <laughs> sure. I think the point there, right, is that they shouldn't feel pressured to do it. I think if they feel inclined to do it, we advocate and try to support the student in terms of what they want to do. Uh, so, is, that, is this one? Okay, we're nearing the end here, so we'll have maybe one more question. Following up on that question, if your student does not take your advice and chooses to double major, um, do they have to fulfill distributional requirements from, say, arts and sciences if that's where their double major is, or they're still they still fill, fulfill the distributional requirement for the art school? Well, Joseph, the advisor, is going to take that one. This will be our last uh, answer, and then we'll be open ourselves up to hang around for the rest of you. Um, for the second, if they're doing a second major, do they need two sets of distribution requirements? No. So it'll be one set of distribution requirements or what we call the general education, and then it'll be their major requirements within their school, and then there'll be a set. Within all of them, 
they're all working within their electives. And so if they're doing a second major, they're doing a minor, it's within the electives. So each program has a set number. Minors can be anywhere from 15 to 18 credits. Second majors can be somewhere in the 30 range. It depends on which school and if there's prerequisites. So prerequisites is where students get hung up the most because they want to jump into a second major, but they haven't taken three prerequisites. So then it might take a little bit longer. The other thing to remember, I just want to make a plug, it is also fine to just explore within the uh, electives and cobble together what they're interested in. Um, I can tell you of the group here, we probably all have minors and nobody's ever asked us in our life what we minored in college. <laughs> On that note, uh, I think I'm going to let, uh, we'll be here if any of you want to talk to us individually for a little bit, but thank you so much. Thanks for coming and uh, congratulations again. Congratulations. <laughs>